and has appeared on numerous media outlets as a nutrition expert. More importantly, JJ is responsible for turning some of the most challenging weight loss resistant cases into stunning success. JJ, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Success Family. We are certainly ready for you to kick our butts into shape. <laughs> it will be my pleasure, Darren. So, JJ, before we delve too deep into the strategies for weight loss and, and healthy living, I, I want our audience to hear a little bit more about you. Talk about what your biggest health challenges have been and how you've dealt with them. What do you have to do every day, no matter what, to make sure that you are your healthiest self? Well, this is very interesting. Uh, about a year and a half ago, my son was the victim of a hit-and-run driver. And he was left for dead in the street, airlifted to the local hospital. They literally told us to let him die. And he spent four and a half months in the ICU and in the hospital. It was the same time as the Virgin Diet was coming out and my PBS show was coming out. And I'm the sole support for my family. So, yes, this was an issue of his health. But in order for me to be there and literally make sure that he lived through this, I had to be uber healthy and uber stress resilient. And I think for all of us, the number one threat we really have is stress. And for us to really be able to play at the level we want to play and work at the level we want to work, it's really about that stress resilient. So that means getting your seven to nine hours of sleep. I, when this happened with Grant, I took it up 100%. There was no margin for error. I ate perfectly. I was getting my sleep. I was getting my exercise in, even if it meant running the hospital stairwells to do so, because I knew I couldn't afford to not be at the top of my game. So as I said in the intro, JJ, there's just so much health and wellness advice and information out there. And a lot of it is misinformation. So tell us what you see is the biggest piece of misinformation out there that we should be very, very wary of. I just have to pick one, huh, Darren? Yeah. <laughs> the one that makes me the craziest is this one. It's just calories in, calories out. If you want to lose weight, just eat less and exercise more. Talk about a statement that sets people up to fail and probably one of the reasons we have the obesity epidemic. So why is that? Well, because here's the thing. If you're hungry... <laughs> It's not going to work long term. You know, if you're if you're not eating what you need to eat, your body actually is going to slow down. So you eat less, your metabolism downshifts. And then if you overdo the exercise, and we'll talk later about the fact that exercise should really be about intensity, not long endurance. When you're doing a lot of endurance training, it makes you hungrier, it ages you faster, and it burns up your muscle. So by eating less, you downshift your metabolism. By over-exercising, you burn up your muscle and downshift your metabolism. So you're making yourself fatter by doing the very things that they're telling you to do to lose weight. So you talk about it not being a balance sheet between calories in, calories out, which leads me to my next question. I've heard you say that our bodies are not, quote unquote, bank accounts. They are more like a chemistry lab in a history book. Explain that to us. Exactly. And that happened because early on when I was working, I realized, I saw firsthand, hey, when I have people cut calories and exercise more, it's not working. So I thought, all right, I'm not insane. What's going on? When you look at it, it's all about it's all about hormones and the chemical messages to our body. And you want to make sure that what you're telling your body is to burn more fat, have steady energy, and slow down the aging process. And ultimately, food is information. And food should be there to fuel you and to heal you, right? So if you're giving your body the right information, it will then burn off fat, hold on to or build muscle and have steady, sustained energy. So it's all about that. And it's also a history book, not just from your genetics, but also because all of these things that you do create hormonal shifts. So if you're chronically cutting your calories and stressing out your body, you're going to impact your thyroid. If you're chronically under stress, you're going to raise your stress hormones and impact your adrenals and your insulin system. So all of these things then create either a good or a bad cycle where you're either burning fat again or storing it. Now, JJ, we live in this instant gratification society, right? People want to see results, if, if not immediately, at least really, really quick. So give us two or three things that we could do to satiate this need so that we can be motivated to keep improving our habits and our health. I think one of the biggest challenges that we do is we say, okay, I'm not going to eat this. Like, let's take bread. I'm not going to have any bread, right? But bread is actually a drug. So is sugar. So is dairy. So if you just take that out and you don't give yourself something in its place, 
you're just setting yourself up to fail. You also do have to be on the emotional side of it. We know that these foods have very addictive qualities. So again, gluten, dairy, sugar, all have drug-like effects. Gluten and dairy have opiate-like effects on the brain. So you have to consider that as well. But again, if you can think of swaps, part of what I do with people as I start with them is if we're pulling out the dairy, we're going to put in almond milk. We're going to put in a coconut Greek style yogurt. So they're not sniffing around trying to find something else. There are also, we all have our trigger foods. I always like to say almond butter is my crack, you know? And if you know you have a trigger food, don't bring the enemy into the house because we all know at nine, 10 o'clock at night, it's going to get in bed with you. That's the way it works. So don't make this hard on yourself. Huh. That's interesting. So let's move into these that have become our vices, right? These addictions that we've got, you know, things that we think we can't live without. I know my three evils are coffee, wine, and occasionally ice cream. I remember we talked about that when we were together. So obviously saying that we can't live without them isn't true, but how do we go about interrupting these addictions? Talk about what we need to do to curb addictions to those things that are negatively impacting our health. For one thing here, Darren, coffee and wine depend on the dose because I'm going to say coffee and wine are health foods and be really controversial there, right? But a little bit of coffee, as we know, can help with focus, can help with burning fat. Too much coffee can burn out your adrenals. A little bit of red wine can slow down the aging process, can lower stress hormones, and too much, and you know, you're going to be having to check into an AA meeting. So with a lot of these things, it's really about looking for what can you put in this place. I find so often we try to pull something out, like we'll say, okay, I, I'm not going to have the ice cream, but you don't put anything into its place that would be, you know, a great substitute. And it doesn't have to be food. You know, instead of ice cream, maybe it's reading, getting in the bath and reading a book. Something that's going to give you another thing to do during the time you would have reached for that addiction so that you don't have a vacuum where you're sitting there only thinking about it. Let's go into uh, the idea of of food intolerances a little bit further. I know that uh, in your book, The Virgin Diet, you focus on this concept a lot. Explain what a food intolerance is and then how we can identify if we are victims of a food intolerance besides just the craving of something. What might be other indicators? Yes, because I did allude to the cravings, but just think about these and you don't have to go TMI, Darren, here, but gas and bloating, (laughs) fatigue, skin issues, congestion, joint pain, autoimmune disorders, mood disorders, you can't think straight, you're... uh, you can't lose weight. Those are all classic signs of food intolerance. And I discovered these because I was working in doctor's offices and we were doing a simple food sensitivity test and people would walk in with those symptoms. We'd run the test. The same foods always showed up. When we pulled them out, the symptoms went away quick. I started to look at this and I went, okay, it's always the same foods. But there's actually more ways that you can become intolerant. What I just described was a low-grade immune reaction, something called an IgG reaction. And these are getting more and more common due to a phenomenon called leaky gut, which is where your gut, your small intestine becomes more permeable. And this can happen due to stress from eating fructose, things like agave and fruit juice concentrate and dried fruit, from medications, from genetically modified foods, from gluten, from being toxic. So, I mean, so many of the things that happen to us on a regular basis make our gut more permeable. And then if we're eating the same reactive foods on a regular basis, they get out into circulation and they start to trigger an immune response. There's also an immediate immune response, like you can't open peanuts on the plane because someone's throat will close up. That's a lot more rare, but these delayed food sensitivities are really common. And then of course, we all know about genetics like lactose intolerance or celiac or fructose malabsorption. And then there's the hormonal issues too, of where if you're eating sugar, you become insulin resistant, you start having adrenal problems. If you're eating gluten, you'll start to have leptin problems. If you're eating a lot of soy, you can have thyroid problems or estrogen problems. So all of those things compile to create this food intolerance. And this happens over time. And the challenge is it creates these low grade symptoms The people are taught to believe are normal. They're normal for them. They're normal signs of aging. And really, it could just be as simple as pulling these foods out for a matter of days to see the difference. So before we leave the food part of this process, let's connect the dots on the emotional side of eating. 
being healthy is not just about what we do, but also what we think and certainly how we feel. So take a moment to talk to us about the emotional side of our health plan. How and why are the two connected? The emotion and thus the health plan and the outcomes of our body. Well, this is where I'm going to really bring stress in. When I work on the virgin diet, obviously I start first with changing what's at the end of your fork. But then once people get through that, I look at sleep and I look at exercise and I look at stress. And what's really interesting is when you look at how people handle stress, it's really their perception of it. And so when you look at what stress can do to you, if you're under chronic stress, you're going to raise your blood sugar, you're going to raise your insulin, you'll start getting better at storing fat, you're going to lower your serotonin, you're going to crave sugar, you're going to lower your dopamine, you're going to be hungrier, you're going to lower your testosterone, you'll lose your sex drive, you won't build muscle, you're going to make your gut more permeable, you'll have more food sensitivity, so you'll start to have more cravings. So what's interesting is you start to look at all of this and see, I come from a place where I don't believe in willpower. If we had willpower, we wouldn't be here as a people group. I don't believe we have cravings because of an emotional issue. I think it's all chemical. This is all our chemistry lab. So if someone's craving sugar, or craving dairy, or, or too hungry, I want to kick back and go, what's going on? And if it's that you're allowing stress to take your health down, then let's look at it. First of all, how can we shift the perception so that you move it from something taking you down to a challenge, because we're never better than when we're challenged and inspired. And then what strategies can you put in place every day to improve your stress resilience, to improve your stress tolerance? Because ultimately, especially for all of us high achievers, what's going to determine our success is that ability to tolerate higher and higher levels of stress. You know, I think the big joke, Darren, is you always think, okay, when I get to that level, it'll be easier. And it's never the case, <laughs> you know, life just, if you can handle curveballs, you're going to get more and more of them. And it ultimately becomes how well can you handle the stress? So since this is an important topic, um, and I don't, I don't have stress, but I, I have a friend who does. So <laughs> can you tell me, how is it that uh, you help people become more stress resilient, as you say, or to have a greater stress tolerance? What are two or three practical tips that you offer people to help them with this issue? I think one of the single best things you can do for stress is exercise. But it's really the right type of exercise. Because exercise is a drug. It can be therapeutic or it can be destructive. So if you're doing endurance style training, you're actually aging your body. If you're doing short intense burst style training where you go all out for 30 to 60 seconds and then recover and all out again or doing resistance training, you know, hard, intense exercise, what you're actually doing is training your sympathetic nervous system to handle stress and recover and handle stress and recover. And that's going to translate over into other areas of your life, right? The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. So if I'm used to going all out and recovering, then I get into a stressful situation. I go, I can go all out and recover from this. So the biggest one for me is exercise. The second one is how you frame your day. Every single morning when I get up, I intention. I sit down and I write out what I see for the day and I frame it. And I think that sense of, of an inspiring challenge, but also the control that you have is helpful. And the third thing is making sure that you are putting the time in for sleep. What I find with a lot of us who are out there building businesses is we tend to steal from sleep. We get excited about a project or we have so much to do and then we start to steal from sleep, which is the most stressful thing you can do to your body. So if you wanna be able to handle stress better, you've gotta give your body time to heal, which is what we do when we sleep. I'm curious about this. Make sure that we asked you all the important questions. What is the most frequent question that you get asked as a health and wellness expert? And then what's your most common response? Most common question, what can I eat? <laughs> and diving deeper into that question is really, how can I eat sugar and get away with it, JJ, right? So it's interesting. I'm always looking for healthy swaps. In the Virgin Diet, I have people drop seven foods, as you know, drop seven foods, lose seven pounds, just seven days. But the real secret as to how it works is we reduce inflammation quickly, but we swap out. So as I'm pulling these foods out, I'm giving them things in their place so they don't miss the foods. 
But one of the biggest issues people have is sugar because we are making a nation full of sweet tooths because we keep sweetening foods more and more and more, especially with all these horrible artificial sweeteners. So the ones that I have people put in their place, because ultimately the question of what can I eat is how can I still keep eating these things I shouldn't be eating, is go ahead and use monk fruit or erythritol or xylitol or stevia. But start tapering down these things because you want to retrain your taste buds to appreciate natural sweetness and savory and spicy rather than this artificially sweetened and fructose sweetened food. Please bang the pulpit a little bit on artificial sweeteners. Why are they so horrible? Oh, thank you. Why do we have artificial sweeteners? I mean, you look at why we design these. We design these so basically people could have their cake and eat it too, so that we could eat sweet and lose weight. And yet, when you look at every single study around them now, they're showing, hey, the people who drink the diet soda every day are gaining weight versus the people who drink the regular soda. And why is this? It's because when you eat sweet, you crave sweet. Artificial sweeteners are so much sweeter than regular sugar that just makes us want sweeter and sweeter food. It causes calorie dysregulation. They did a rat study where they fed rats sugar water, let them eat, they ate what they needed. Then they gave them artificially sweetened water, Again, let them eat. They ate what they needed to maintain their weight. When they went back to regular sugar water, they overate because they lost the ability to calibrate the degree of sweetness with the calories. Plus, we know that these artificial sweeteners now are raising insulin. They're also feeding the bad bacteria in the gut. And it's really interesting. If you feed the bad bacteria in your gut, your gut can extract more calories from the foods you eat and store them as fat. So even if you're eating the same amount of food, if you've got more bad bacteria in your gut, you will store more fat. I mean, how frightening is that? And we know they raise insulin and we know they're toxic. And toxicity is its own factor for weight loss resistance because it slows down your metabolism and makes you hold on to fat where we store the toxins. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next question. So I asked you what the frequently most asked question is to you. The question I always like to add on to that that sometimes I get asked is, what is the question people should be asking you that you don't get asked often enough? In other words, what's the question that brings out maybe the most poignant advice that if somebody would just ask the question, they'd get it from you? I guess the question would be, so what's the single most important thing that I could do right now that could change my health overnight? Because, you know, anyone who knows me will think that I'm going to answer something about food. But in reality, if I had to pick one thing only to have everyone listening start with, I would tell them to focus on their sleep. Because that is the single biggest issue I see out there right now is that people are not sleeping well. They're using technology right before bed, which is lighting up their neurons and interrupting their good night's sleep. And even one poor night of sleep, Darren, the next day you're more insulin resistant, which means you're better at storing fat. You're more leptin resistant, which means you're hungrier. You got your stress hormones are up, which means you're storing belly fat. Your serotonin's down, which means you're craving sugar. And we all know that. You don't get a good night's sleep. You're not energetic. You don't want to work out. Your immune system's lowered. And you're wanting sugar and caffeine. So if I could pick one thing to help people, in fact, there was an interesting study that was done and all they did was have people sleep more and they lost weight. Hmm. You know, it's it's funny, uh, I guess not funny, but should be obvious. This was Dr. Oz's answer as well. I asked him a slightly different question. I said, what's the one thing somebody could do to help them in their anti-aging and their wellness the most? And he said, sleep. And then what was number two was water. And number three was walk, which is interesting that none of this is very complex. Right. (laughs) It's not that difficult, right? It's all quite simple and actually a lot simpler than people make it out to be if they would just actually do it, right? It's just the doing part of it. It's not the knowing part of it. It's the doing part of the equation. What are some tools or some ways to keep awareness or ways to track? I mean, You can explain what to do to somebody, which we try to do every single month inside the pages of Success Magazine, but then to get them to do it and then to get them to stick to it. That's the great challenge of human psychology. Any ideas, thoughts, or tools or methods that uh, you've seen to work over the long haul? Yes. I love this question so much because 
First of all, the number one thing I have people do on the program is I have them journal. And by the way, just an old paper journal, nothing fancy. Really clear, the research shows that people who write it down lose twice as much weight as people who don't. So the simplest thing, whether it's losing weight, exercising, deciding you're going to get that sleep, tracking your water, is to write it down. You can use an app. You can use a journal. It doesn't matter. But that's the number one. Write it down. Number two, pick one thing. When I start people on the program, I don't have them start with exercise and sleep and stress and dropping seven foods. No way. That You set them up to fail. Pick one. Right now, I'm going to drop the seven foods. I'm going to get through that. Then I'll start with burst training. I'll get through that. I'll start resistance training. You do that till that becomes your new normal. And then to help you keep it the new normal, remember I said find fitter friends? It is so important, whether it's a coach, an accountability partner, or a support group, to have that constant right there. And I love it. You know, when you have someone that you check in with on a regular basis, you know, all of these online groups where you check in on a regular basis and report in what you're doing, that is so key because if you're not there, they're going to go, hey, you know, you'll get an email, you'll get a text, you'll get a phone call. Did you drop off? Back when I saw people one-on-one, when I first started with them, they had to email me every single day and tell me what they were eating or I fired them. So in trying to pull this whole thing together, because I really asked you the question that I would normally ask, which is what's that one final memorable thing that you want everybody to start with as a reflection of this interview? So you answered that. So instead, what I'd love to have you summarize is if you could be remembered for one thing, and it doesn't have to be your greatest mission, but just the one thing, kind of that one hook. It's almost like when I interviewed David Bach who wrote Finish Rich. And his one thing is that he's known for the latte factor, right? Mm -hmm. Inside my book, The Compound Effect, even though there's a bigger overriding objective for the whole book, people remember the thank you journal that I wrote for my wife. So if there's one thing that would just be a memorable association for you in your work, so that six, nine months from now, people are reflecting back on this interview. They're like, yeah, I remember that one thing about J.J. Virgin. And that has been an anchor in my life ever since. What do you think that might be? You know, it's interesting. I didn't choose this, but I started seeing it repeated all over the place. And it is that mantra of your body isn't a bank account. It's a chemistry lab. And what's happened by using that statement is that people all of a sudden go, oh, you know what? I've been following the wrong set of rules. And that's why this wasn't working for me. And it gives them their hope back. Because ultimately, what I want to help people do is see that they can be better. If they've tried all these different things and they haven't worked, it was because they were doing the wrong things. And I want them to have that hope back because without the belief, without the hope, nothing happens. So again, that mantra, which I started seeing quoted all over the 